Hey everybody, welcome to Homestead Help. This is our fourth episode and this month we are going to be talking about uh, preserving and all the different things that go along with that. Uh, first off, uh, kind of a technical note here, we have had some storms passing through my area so as your host I feel it necessary to let you know that should everything kind of go dark for a second, have no fear, give me a few seconds to try to get back online or I'll pass a message uh, through other means to uh, Tommy and Patty here so they can let you know what our plans are from there. But crossing our fingers, it looks like we'll be clear, but just wanted to give you the heads up uh, ahead of time. So let me introduce for all of our new viewers, uh, Patty and Tommy Alderman from Alderman Farms. Go ahead and say hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, so, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hello. <laughs> there you go. Um, we hope to be joined here shortly by uh, Margie Fuller of um, Margie's Cottage Kitchen, as well uh, later in the broadcast by Pepper Bradford of uh, Pepper's Plants. Uh, both of them were just uh, trying to finish up some prior engagements, but they hope to join us here shortly. So that said, uh, we're just going to start casually chatting here a little bit about uh, preserving. Now, <laughs> Tommy, I got to tell you, man, there's not too much that I do uh, for preserving. My expertise and what we actually do around here is pretty much freezing. Uh, if it's not being vacuum sealed and put in the deep freezer, that's about all we do. Yeah, but but you've hit on you've hit on an important point. There there are lots of mistakes that can be made in freezing meat, for example. So I would just encourage you to talk a little bit about the vacuum sealing. We uh, we do the same. And Patty's not going to talk about vacuum sealing today, probably, because we we're going to be talking about other methods not related to meat necessarily. Uh, so tell us a little bit about why you vacuum seal. What's the, what's the deal? Why do that? Well, it, to be honest with you, it just seemed like the right thing to do. It was never a matter of uh, trial and error. We didn't start trying to store meat uh, in another way and then decide to back up and, and buy a vacuum sealer. We had just heard that it was a better way to start off. And so many years ago, it's actually this uh, silver machine right here behind me. Uh, we just decided to buy one, and that's what we have done ever since. And, you know, we see a lot of benefits from it. There's some, some little tricks uh, that that are definitely something that you learn as you go along. For example, if you ever buy um, meat in the store, uh, you almost uh, always see those uh, absorbent packs underneath them where it uh, picks up the juices and whatnot. And that's kind of something that you have to be concerned about when it comes to vacuum sealing is that the moisture can get in the way of actually making the seal. And our model, and I'm sure many of the others out there have a little safety device on it where if the moisture gets in there, it trips the circuit, and so it won't even let you try to seal it. So our little trick for that is to take a uh, paper towel and fold it up in such a way that it takes up the entire width of the uh, package and then put it in the sealer, and as it starts to vacuum the air out, you'll see it gets... Uh, once it gets down to most of the air being out, you'll see the juices start to go up the paper towel. And that gives you a really good buffer to sit there. And even if you can't vacuum seal it entirely, meaning you can't get all the air out, once you see the moisture hit the edge of the paper towel, then, again, on our model, and I presume all others, you can then manually tell it to go ahead and seal and that way you got as much air out as you could and the moisture didn't get in the way of you making the seal. So that's that's probably the, the best tip I have for something like that. But uh, it's got other benefits too, I guess. You know, you don't have to buy a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. They sell rolls uh, of the bagging material. So you can, you know, make a, if you want a bag that's just that big or if you want a bag that fits an entire duck, then you can do that. So, um it's it's versatile in that sense. Are are you pur purposely avoiding saying what model that you have? Uh, I don't, I don't I mean, know. Maybe we should I, I do no that. I don't know. But... <laughs> got, oh, okay. It, it's made by a company called Food Saver, uh, and it's the silver yeah. Yeah. behind me. That, that's all I know. It, I don't know the model or anything. I but the manufacturer is called Food Saver. 
Um, we we also have a vacuum sealer, and you know one thing that it does is it, like you were talking about, it removes the air, um, mm -hmm. and the bags are a bit thicker, and it helps to prevent the uh, frost. Uh, where it freezer burn. Freezer burn, yeah, freezer burn. That's where. That's right. Also, um, I'll show you some of my snap beans and stuff that I I have uh, frozen. Also, um, what you do if you don't have a vacuum sealer, you have to double bag and. The vacuum sealer totally eliminates that because of the the way the bags are made. You it, you can just use the single layer. That's right. Yeah. And here, speaking of technical difficulties, Patty and I both are having technical difficulties yeah. with our throats. Our voice. Uh, our voices. Uh, mine's actually a little stronger today than it has been, and hers is on the down slope. <laughs> so I hope uh, I hope you can hear us okay. I thought I was the one with five children to yell at. I don't know what your excuse could possibly be. <laughs> um, well, let's see here. You know, the uh, the vacuum seal, I think you're right, Patty. We've never uh, experienced any kind of freezer burn on the meats that, that we save by putting them in the vacuum sealer and then putting them away. Um, so I, I can only presume that that means that it's because of the benefit of doing the vacuum sealing first because you know, if we buy bagged meat at the store then then we see freezer burn on some of the products so that's right you, you know, know and we all uh, we're all about saving money and being frugal and this and that but there are certain items that you need to spend as much money as you can as your budget will stand, and these is one of them. I think Patty would agree because we went through at least one, maybe two. We're on our, we're on our second one. I, I'm talking about before we found one that did what we needed. In other words, we, we started with like the least expensive, and then we went to the well, next. Well, we went or to a medium, like and then we've got the more expensive one. I believe our model is like Jared's, except that it's white. But uh, I've had an issue with it the last few times I've tried to use it. In fact, I wasn't even going to try and use it this last year because I was so frustrated with it. But I'm going to try one more time, and I'm going to try the paper towel because I think that may be what my problem is because I just can't get it to seal, and I believe it's because of the moisture. Yeah, it, it may be worth it. It may be <clears throat> worth you know. You may have to get one better than just the the very the very cheapest one. Yeah. And of course, you can you can do some research and you can pay a lot of money. For yes. some very very fancy high dollar machines out there that will, um, I wish I'd have thought about this ahead of time because I'll never remember it. But I remember we saw one somewhere, so and it was just unbelievable what it what it would do. Mm -hmm. But it was thousands of dollars or something. And you know, for what it's worth, they're not just for vacuum sealing uh, bags for going in the freezer either. Uh, we've used ours. Uh, probably my favorite second thing to do with ours is use it to quickly marinate beef jerky uh, before going in the dehydrator. Uh, you can get these uh, plastic um, kind of Tupperware looking containers that have the special seal at the top that you can connect the, uh, there's a tube that comes out of an attachment on here that you attach onto the top of it and it has a couple different settings on that seal. Uh, one for it to be on, I think, which is just closed. You know, it's sealed uh, off so that it's open air. And then another one for marinate. And it puts it on uh, using that setting along with the setting on here for marinate. It kind of pulses. It takes the air out, lets the air in, takes it out, and it, and it sucks those juices into the meat and lets it relax. And um, so I can marinate beef jerky in eight minutes and throw it on the dehydrator and, and do it all very back to back. And I'm sure there's other applications for it too, but that's the one that, that we use it for. I think they market those containers more for, you know, um, just leftover <coughs> storage, if you will, something that you're going to put in the container, seal it so you can put it in the refrigerator to use the next day. But, um, Anyway, it's just got more uses than just that one function. So if you're looking at one and thinking, good gracious, I'm not going to pay that, just realize there's other features to it as well. Also, I've not done it with our, our um, what is it called? Vacuum sealer. Our vacuum sealer. But you can, they say that you can also reseal your chip, potato chip bags and all, which around here they don't last that long, but, you know, it would, would help them to stay fresh longer. 
Mm. Yeah, I've, I haven't tried that either. But yeah, you can. You don't have to actually vacuum seal. You can just seal. Uh, matter of fact, right. um, we've uh, uh, butchered a duck here over the weekend that we're going to rotisserie, and rather than vacuum seal it and, and crush the thing down, it's just in a bag that's been sealed off and in the refrigerator waiting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. But, you know, the mm -hmm. you know, as I think about preserving, probably the one thing, I think if we got a tractor. If I had a if I had a tractor with a backhoe tomorrow, I think my first project I'd have to work on is building a root cellar. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Tommy and Patty, maybe you know about it. The one thing that kind of concerns me, I don't know how root cellars do in our area uh, here in Mississippi because the ground can be so moist. Is that any kind of concern? Can you have just a dirt root cellar? <laughs> I believe you can, but I think you're going to have issues like you're talking about with the moisture um, and and the spoilage because our root cellars won't be near as cool as they are, say, up north. I mean, they used to have more like spring houses here. You know, in the spring, you know, they would make a little house over the creek or the spring where you could set your milk in and stuff like that, but it wouldn't really be for your vegetables. One thing we yeah, had I don't know. I haven't, I haven't. Go ahead. Well, one thing we had talked about was, um, I guess the easiest example is the prefabricated storm shelters uh, that mm -hmm. have ventilation in it and not powered ventilation, but just, you know, air current going through it and the possibility mm -hmm. of using one of those getting one essentially big enough that it could be a dual purpose storm shelter. It, it's not just a shelter, but it's also the roof cellar. I don't, I don't, it's just an idea we've tossed around. I don't know what the feasibility of that is, but we thought about it because of what you were saying, Patty, with the circulation of the air. Mm -hmm. we, I'm bound and determined to preserve some meat with uh, using salt and, and brine and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And we've intended and smoke. to and smoke. And we've intended to do that the last couple of years. The problem is we haven't had the meat to try it with. Mm -hmm. um, I won't go into that long story, but we didn't get a single deer uh, during deer season last year because our, we were overrun with poachers. Let's just put it to you know the short version of that story. And uh, <clears throat> of course, this gives me an opportunity to mention my pigs again. Um, but, you know, once we have uh, increased our population of our American guinea hogs and we've got, um, I, I, I don't want to waste any meat, but obviously there's bound to be a little bit of experimentation involved. And um, so I, I want to say not waste meat, but surplus. You know, when we have enough meat put together with our vacuum sealer, you know, in, in ways that we know we can trust, then, then, I, then I definitely want to spend some time uh, trying to perfect preserving meat, the the because you know I mean people ate meat 300 years ago, 200 years ago, and and they were able to preserve it and uh, without refrigeration and whatnot. And I just I hate to think that we've lost those that knowledge. Yeah, I'm with you. That's kind of my you know we we fall back and rely on electricity an awful lot and. I know that our house isn't, and I don't know if it ever will be, 100% able to operate without electricity, but I'm certainly intrigued to learn the skills and have what I can that that operates without electricity, like the root cellar, uh, or like we're going to get to uh, canning and preserving in that way here shortly, you know, that doesn't require you to have the electricity to get um, to get the job done. Wow. You know, you you ought to be experimenting with uh, preserving some of that duck meat using salt, you know, salted methods. Because I mean, you have what, like forty two thousand ducks at your house, <laughs> plus or minus, <laughs> plus or minus. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to keep up. Uh, Jennifer's on me every weekend to butcher something to do, whether it's one, two, or ten of them. Just butcher something before they outnumber us to the point where we can't control them. <laughs> uh, well, but we have an idea for a couple. Patty wanted to tell Jennifer we're in the market. 
Yes. Uh, okay. We, we all of uh, yeah. We butchered our last big Drake. I didn't realize he was the last big Drake, but uh, and our Guys our hens have disappeared. <clears throat> I, I have no idea. No sign. No carcass. No feathers. Don't know. And they've been here forever. And I, you know, I guess they just finally said time to move on. I don't know, but so we. I'm gonna get with you uh, at a future date about uh, purchasing some of your stock. All right. Fair enough. You know the. Um, you know, I guess one reason that preserving never really took center stage for us was that I've always, excuse baby in the background. Um, I've always had more of the mindset of if I can have a perpetual food source, then mm -hmm. preserving is a, is more of a backup. I never really looked at it from the from from the actual homesteading concept, if you will, of you know, harvest, you know, grow during the summer, harvest during autumn so that you have food to eat all winter. I want to have production the entire year, and then whatever I store away is, is more of an emergency reserve rather than what's going to be my primary food for a given time of the year. And and I yeah. may be deluded to think that way, but that's the, probably the reason why uh, preserving's kind of been a, a, not on the front burner for us. Well, it's, it's kind of hard to do that, though, when you're talking about vegetables. Of course, your meat, and we usually get our meat in the wintertime. But with our vegetables, you know, we're so limited of what we can grow in the wintertime. And it, there's parts of our winter, even though we don't have such a hard winter, I don't believe there's any vegetable that we can actually be growing. Even our greens and all, it's going to die out when it gets cold enough, I think. Well, you know, but I see things like pepper um, growing tomatoes in yeah. his uh, high hoop house, house there, yeah. mm -hmm. and and it makes me wonder, you know, what could we grow? Maybe we wouldn't have the same buffet available to us that we could grow through right. the summer, but in our climate, <clears throat> maybe there is something. Well, yeah, you're correct in saying that with the hoop house, you could keep, you know, your your winter crop probably growing in a hoop house. Uh, tomatoes all winter? I don't know. Did Pepper do pepper, did tomatoes all winter or just through November? Well, he, I don't know. Pepper, December. Pepper will say, uh, and I think Pepper may be saying something on Facebook now. Let me talk and you look that up, Jared. See if Pepper sent us a message. I think he did. Um, pepper would say that, you know, the hoop house will allow you to extend mm -hmm. your growing season. But Pepper <clears throat> uses, uh, Pepper has methods to heat his soil that uh, as of this moment as I understand relies on electricity so um, you know he's got some really fantastic methods for he's got these little pipes running through the dirt you know they keep the soil at, uh, at a certain temperature that allows him to grow bountifully uh, through the winter yeah, and that makes a difference that soil temperature has got to you've got to have the soil temperature to be able to germinate your seed even. You're being photobombed, Jared, and it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my wife, we have, you know, a set routine and this is the night this is the time of night where the cats get fed and they must have been bugging her and she decided she was gonna do it one way or the other. I don't blame oh, her. Oh that's cat. fine. <laughs> no. So well, the Pepper the uh, just for sake mm -hmm. of mentioning it, uh, I think Pepper was kinda of bowing out there. He was saying his uh, other obligations seem to be uh, gonna take up more time than he was expecting. So we might not get him here. Uh, this evening. Okay. okay. Well, why don't we start uh, talking a little bit more about uh, the, I guess, I don't know if it's, maybe you guys can tell me if this is the right word, the more traditional sense of preserving, or maybe it's simply the most popular uh, way of preserving. I'm not sure which, which word's more accurate, but I think a it's, lot it's of people... It's becoming more and more popular. <clears throat> yeah. I think I think when people think about preserving, probably the first thing to come to mind is going to be canning, uh, specifically pressure canning. Um, but you know, my limited understanding is that there's a much wider variety than just plain old Jane pressure canning. And uh, since Tommy is a techno guru and Jared is a duck fanatic, uh, we ha luckily have. Patty Alderman here to lean upon as our 
crutch to explain these things to us. <laughs> Wait, so, I, I, I'm not a techno guru. I'm a pig guy. <laughs> okay, excuse me, I, I, pig guy. I'm a man of the pigs. <laughs> That's right. So, Patty, um, I, I, since I am not uh, very fluent in these things, I really don't know uh, even exactly what to to ask you about, um, but maybe you can step us through some of the things that you think we ought to learn about. Okay. All right, here's what we're going to do. Patty's going to take her earpiece out um, because she's got a display set up back here. I'm going to also step off of the screen, and Patty's going to talk about some things from back there, and um, well, I hope you know, I'm going to adjust the mic to for make sure it picks up her voice a little better. And then I'll th certain things I'll hand up in front of the camera, um, so that anybody watching can see. Okay, so we're both going to be off of the. But if you have to ask something, remember she can't hear you. I'm going to have to relay it. Number one, you're going to need to get a canning book, and this is the Ball Boy book, <clears throat> and it's going to have your recipes and it's going to have your instructions. It'll be uh, on freezing, uh, dehydrating, uh, canning all the different things and the requirements because a lot of people don't follow the requirements uh, and it's USDA approved they've tested these recipes and it's safe because you can get sick if you do not can things correctly so it's very important that you do can correctly I'm just going to show you a few things you'll need of course you'll need canning jars the lids bands wait let me drop that and this little thing, you don't. This is not a have to, but it makes it a lot easier when you're putting jelly or liquid in to have this little thing right there. It's basically a funnel, but it, but it's a funnel that is designed to mm -hmm. fit nicely into the mouth of a jar. All right, wait, wait, let me see. Take that off, please. You also want to have one of these. You'll have your lid and your band on because your jars are very hot to pick your jars up, just like that. And of course, you want to have a ladle. There's a few things that you won't have handy in your kitchen, like one of these things. I just call it a jar picker upper. But <laughs> anyway, they're inexpensive, just a few dollars. Where, where's that available, Patty? Walmart. They have them okay. at Fred's. Yeah, there, there's a, a there's places. a nice selection of canning items That's in correct. Walmart. Walmart and at Fred's. Fred's. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to go to a specialty store. There's different ways of different things you preserve differently. Um, jellies are one of the more simple ones. This is uh, peach jelly. Um, you, what you, you would need to use, uh, you, of course you have to have peaches in your jars and your lids, um, but then you would have some kind of pectin. This is called jellies. I get this at uh, Save-A-Lot. It's 99 cents. It's now, very on, Patty, that, this, that was pectin. You said you just kind of ran over that. Yeah. See where it says, it says fruit Pectin, that's a necessary ingredient. Yeah, it's, uh, it's your thickening jelly. agent. And of course, sugar goes in there. I was just going to show you a few things that I've done. And this is just goes in a hot water bath. It doesn't have the pressure canner. And it's just for like, no, you don't have to have a, a hot water bath for the jelly. You just have to have a pot large enough to cook it. Um, and you will sterilize your jars before you do it. And the instructions are in on the um, pectin box. Um, but this is strawberry figs here. Let me mention this too. You, you're noticing there's no lid screwed on this, but it's sealed. Yeah, and I do that because I reuse my bands. But if I was to travel this anywhere, if it would do anything more than just sit on the shelf, I would put my band on it to protect this. So this is some figs I did last year. My figs are just now starting to come in. This is some Thanks. apples that I bought. This is an applesauce. Tommy. And this is just... Yeah, Jerry. And apples. Hang on, Patty. Could you could you ask Patty to explain a little bit about if she knows anything about the different kinds of lids and why she uses the ones that she does? Um, explain why you about the different kinds of lids and why you use the ones that you use. Um, there are different uh, name brands of lids. Um, these are ball. Um, I had a bad experience one year when I first started canning. Um, but I've just recently talked to a lady that, that the brand that I had a problem with, that's all she uses. And so, and it is less expensive, so I am going to go back to trying those lids and see how they work. So, okay. okay. Next, I want to talk to you about 
uh, is pickled stuff, and it's with vinegar. And this has got high acid, and so it also it goes into the hot water bath pot, which is this pot back here. And it's just going to be uh, in a hot water bath for about 10 or 15 minutes once you get everything in. This is some pickled snap beans. Uh, it's just vinegar and water and dill and salt. Um, I, I have an H on the top of my jar, which tells me that I've put a little bit of cayenne pepper, and it also has a piece of garlic in here. So. And, and what did you do to the beans? You uh, blanch them? No, or? you don't blanch the beans. All you have to do is snip the little ends off, of, and I use very young beans, and my mom does this for me. She uh, picks the ends off, and I, we leave them whole, and just put and wash them very good, and put them in the jar. And so this is a very simple method. You do have to buy a special pot for this. And I'll show you the pot when I sh after I get through the so That's kind of a combination of methods there. You're talking about a preservation, pickling and canning. Yeah, it's two different things. Uh, well, I mean, they're both canned. One is pressure can, and one is hot water bath canning. And we're talking about hot water bath now. Um, this is uh, jalapeno peppers, and this is just water, uh, vinegar, and a little salt. And there's a written in the ball book. It has the recipes for all of this. Here's some dill pickles, the same thing. It's vinegar, water, salt, and some dill, and a, a piece of garlic in there. Patty, I know that. Uh, also, let me, excuse me. Talk, another thing I found this year that I'm trying is called Pickle Crisp. It's by Ball, and it is to help your uh, pickles and everything stay crisp. And so I, I believe that it does make a difference. Patty, I know... Um, Everybody will quickly recognize, I say everybody, most everybody will quickly recognize that there are inherent dangers with pressure canning. We haven't got to that yet. But dangers with hot water bath, other than the obvious, getting burned yeah. and the, being right with the recipe. Yeah, it's important that you follow the recipe. Uh, for instance, you know, all of these pickled recipes are at least half vinegar. Um, that's very important. That brings your acid level up. That's what preserves your food. That's what keeps the botulism spore from growing if the spore is in there. Um, if you were to start reducing the vinegar and adding more water, then you're going to run into danger of possibly getting sick and there's a possibility of dying. It's very, very serious bacteria that can grow in our food. That's why I say get a book and go buy the recipes in the book and get a new book. Um, I'll tell you a story. This is my pickled uh, okra and this is from last year. My friend, Therese Clark, that taught me how to can, and she has shared so much wealth of information, uh, she saved, saved our lives probably because when Tom and I moved to a house about 15 years ago, this book was there. And you'll see it's, it's the Ball Blue Book. And the only problem about this book is that it is, it is from 1974. And I was going to go buy this book and use it. And my friend showed up at my house with, for me, a brand new book. She said, Patty, you've got to follow current recipes. So it's very important. <laughs> now, this is, um, now, and I'll tell you this, it's not good to go by uh, your great-great-grandmother's recipe for this or that. But if it follows, if it falls in line with what you see in the book, it's okay. This is my papa's recipe of pepper sauce. And... It is straight vinegar poured over cleaned peppers, and we love it. I know it's safe because it's straight vinegar, and it's brought to a boil. You know, it's it's even safer than my pickled snap beans because that has half water, half vinegar. So I know this is okay. So this is an old recipe that's okay to use. And it's mighty fine. We love it. And this is my homemade salsa. I have, I have played with this recipe, but I've been very careful that I haven't altered the vinegar in the recipe. There is vinegar in it. Tomatoes have a high acid content, but most salsa recipes will call for more and, uh, and sometimes even lemon juice. And so, you know, I'm very careful. I may, you know, add less sugar because I don't like a sweet salsa because my sugar in salsa, it's, that's not what's preserving it. But it's very careful. But you should be very careful to follow the recipe. And here, <clears throat> here is my pot. And what makes it different from different from it, just any other stock pot is that it has this basket. Put a few jars in here. In here? Yeah. I'll show them how it goes in here. 
I don't know how it goes. <laughs> no, you don't know how it goes. No. This, if I was doing a hot water bath, of course I would uh, be doing all the same thing. Where it have the same amount of time. That's enough. Pick the pot up. I would have my pot with boiling water, and see this steeps right down. Now you cannot put quarts in this pot. The biggest jar you can put is the pints, and of course you can put the half pints in there. But that's my hot. That's for a hot water bath. So okay, you can just. And how hot do you have to get it? At it's, all? it's boiling. It's boiling water. And how high does it have to be? The in water. The, pot? the water actually comes over the top of the jars. Comes over the top of the jars. Yeah. Next is one that uh, can be very dangerous. It's called a pressure canning. Um, and this is my pressure canner, and it has the we call it a jiggler. I don't really know the name. Yeah, I don't know it either. Has, the it jiggler. Has the gauge, and it's very important every year or so to have your gauge checked and you can go to your you can call your extension office and they actually do that for free as a service to the public and they will check your gauge mine is off one degree um, so instead of when I snap beans and squash are, are pressured at 10 pounds of pressure um, so I have to do mine at 12 I mean at 11 it's off so, one, one pound yeah it's one off one it's pound off one, one pound yeah so that's no big deal I can still use it I just have to make sure I use it at 11, put it on 11 for 10. Um, so I just I had it checked again this year because I knew it was off a little bit to be safe. This is my squash from last year. I do have issues sometimes with my squash. The water comes out of it. Um, I've tried different things. Uh, if somebody has an answer, I would love to know. Um, it's still good, but the water cooks out and you have to pressure that I think it's 40 minutes I'm not 100 percent because I haven't done it this year this is my snap beans and this these snap beans are from 2011 um, we didn't eat them all and I still have the same problem my water level goes down it should stay up I'm doing a little something wrong I'm not sure what it is are these recipes in the ball book too yeah same um, book yeah same book um, and also with your pressure canner you will find You'll have a book that will give you all your instructions on how much water you put in it and, you know, how to bring it up. And I always take my book out and go my, by my book each time. I'm a little nervous. I never leave the kitchen. I have the, have the pot turned where I can see it. If I don't have stuff to do right here, I get a magazine and I just sit in the kitchen while I'm canning because they can explode. They can be dangerous. But if you treat, if you respect them and treat them appropriately, you're fine. Um, but uh, I want to tell you, I bought this pressure canner probably 15 years ago, and I bought it. That's when we didn't have, we didn't have extra money to be buying stuff like this. And I actually found it, I think, in one of the market. I forget what Louisiana called theirs. We were living there then, but like the market bulletin, and I bought it for $25. So I got a real good deal out of it, and it's in perfect condition. And one day I'll have to replace this, but I'm still not looking at that much money investment in it. Um, next, I want to tell you about dehydration. It's something that I've really not done a whole lot of. I've been starting to experiment, and I'm really liking the aspects of it. This is what I've done most recently. This is squash that I've dehydrated, and we've all taken a taste today, and we're I think we're in pretty much agreement that we like it. Here, Jared, try a piece. See what you think. Here, hand me that bag. And this is some okra that we've cut and dehydrated. Oops. I'm supposed to be handing it in front of the camera, and I had it, I'm trying to hand it to Jerry. That's the cut okra. And I've been told that you can actually rehydrate this and then fry it. So I'm going to try it and see. And this is some, some baby okra, you know, some small okra that I've just tried. And it's fantastic. I, I tried some of this a little bit earlier. And uh, she, everybody in the family except me loves Patty's pickled okra. I don't like it. I don't like the sliminess of it, but I love that dehydrated okra. And this Tommy. is some of my apple that I yeah. actually did last year. Yeah, Jared? I wanted to ask Patty about her, uh, her dehydrated okra. Does she do anything to it before dehydrating it? What do you do to the okra before dehydrating it? Some of the okra I actually put salt on. Some of the okra I put a little Tony's on. Um, some of it I didn't do anything to because I was experimenting. 
and I'm leaning towards okra with just salt. Tommy seems to like the okra with some Tonys on it. So hey, wait just a minute. Tonys oh. is Louisiana slang for Tonys Chacheries, uh, which is a, a Louisiana seasoning blend. Uh, it's similar to Zatarans. Uh, I, I'm not sure where any of our viewers, what part of the country they may be in, you know, but it's just a pepper blend. Uh, yeah, off, it. Oh, that's true. You know, yeah. so good stuff. Um, one but, thing I want to share with y'all that here's the squash that I dehydrated, and the way I store it is in canning jars with the lid, and you want it tight to where the uh, well, we have a lot of humidity here, but you may not where you're at, but we do, but where the humidity won't get in. But the way to test it to see. Uh, of course, it's going to tell you in your book if it should be leathery or crunchy or wh what the texture should be. But to make sure you have it all, all the um, moisture out, you can turn it upside down and you see how it has an air space here. And you leave it sit like that uh, overnight. And if it has too much moisture in it, you're going to see moisture condensation collect on the top up here. And then you'll know you'll need to rehydrate it some more. I just learned dehydrate that. Dehydrate it. Dehydrate it, yes. That's a good tip. And I just want to show, can they see over here? At the, uh, yeah, I think so. This is my dehydrator here. And I was just going to show you, we put some more okra in this evening to start dehydrating. I can't get it to show. That's good. Anyway. Um, Anything else, dear? I think that that's... That's about all I have. That's about all she has. It's about all, it's about all the voice she has anyway. All right. <laughs> well, you two sit back down, oh, and I I've got to a... Show. I want to show my free frozen stuff. I forgot about it. Oh, yeah. Hang on one one second. She wants to show you the um, what she mentioned earlier about if you don't have a vacuum sealer, uh, then it's a good idea to double bag things. This is our corn. The only way I put up corn mm -hmm. is in a Ziploc bag or a vacuum, sealer. vacuum sealer. I can't say vacuum sealer. But see, this corn I put in two bags. And that will keep this corn good for at least a year, if not longer. And I, I, it just really works very good. And I don't always use freezer bags. Um, these, I think these are actually storage bags, but the trick is using two. We're not. We don't. We're not sure. We don't vouch necessarily that. Well, I don't know how long corn is supposed to be frozen for, but yeah, <laughs> we'll eat it. <laughs> as long as it don't taste bad out of the freezer, I eat it. We now, eat it. I want to share with my snap beans what I've done with them. Um, I uh, I blanched them for I believe it's two minutes. Of course, your book's going to tell you exactly how long. Um, and I've taken them out. I've put them in a strainer for a few minutes, and then I put a towel on the table, and I put them on the towel, and then spread out, spread out, and I let them dry. And so when I take, I can take as many out of the bag as I want and cook. And you know, this is just a quart bag, but I have some put up in a gallon bag, and they form their own little ice crystals on them, and they and they may stick together a little bit, but they break apart very easily. And I have to put this into another bag where it will be double sealed and it will be good for a long time. Now this is my squash and what I did with it, I didn't just blanch it, I cooked it all the way down um, uh, smothered because I make something called squash bisque that my family loves and that's the main way I reuse my, I use my squash that, that's in the freezer. So You referred to the book again, is that the same ball book? About freezing? Yeah. Yes, yes. Wow, so the Ball Blue Book even has stuff about yeah. freezing it. That's, that seems like a very important book. Yes, it, it is. It's a very important book, very good book to have. All right, Jared. Well, you guys covered an awful lot of good information there, and I think you uh, you touched on a few things that, that um, I have questions about, but also a few things that made me think about some other interesting points. Uh, number one... Uh, when I was talking about the bagger, the vacuum sealer, um, all I was talking about was freezing for meat. But when we first got it, we didn't have our little farm here. And what we would actually do, we were we were looking to preserve food for a long time in case we lost power and things like that. We wanted to have a, a little food reserve. And what we were actually doing was we would go to 
uh, someplace, uh, you know, big grocery store kind of place, and we would buy the, the humongous bags of just enriched uh, rice, and we would bring those home, and then we sealed them into smaller bags, more like, you know, day-use kind of bags. That way we didn't have this humongous thing that was going to go bad all at one time or have to keep resealing a bag, uh, which is another option. People do that as well, you know, keep it in a big bag, and then as they use it for the day, they'll just reseal it again. But what we did was portion it out into daily use kind of things so that we didn't have to keep uh, resealing it because kind of the thought process to us was, well, if the power's out and we're to the point where we're having to use our food reserve, we probably wouldn't be able to reseal it. So it made more sense to do that. So there's a lot of dry use uh, goods for it too. Um, and you talked about the dehydrator. I suppose that is another kind of uh, method of preservation that we've done here. Uh, we've used it uh, to make, oh, what would you call them, um, fruit leathers. Uh, making fruit leathers, uh, we've done that from um, you know just buying things like applesauce, plain, you know, nothing added to it, applesauce from the store, and uh, making fruit leather. If you expect me to hear you, sir, I cannot. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, but also things like you know, and then kind of the fallback onto the meat. I love making beef jerky at the house. I mean, it is a million times cheaper than trying to buy beef jerky in the store and taste a whole lot better because it's not loaded up. I mean, it's beef jerky. It's meat preservation, so it's going to be loaded with salt, but it's not as loaded with salt as what you buy in the store or all the other stuff that they put in it. It's just a much better taste to it. Um, so I, I appreciate you throwing the dehydrator in with your presentation there, Patty, because um, I think that's uh, got a lot of valuable things to it as well. And you showed some apples. We've got three apple trees out front that, with any luck, they might bloom next year. Uh, they're set either to do it next year or the year after. So hopefully next year we'll start seeing some. And that's those are kind of things we're looking to do with it. Is uh, we've got uh, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, and Granny Smith. So we're trying to kind of cover the whole spectrum. And uh, we, we've got different varieties, not only so we have fresh eating and also for baking. But also so we can, uh, from from our limited understanding of it, the best apple juices and ciders are the ones that are made that's with right. multiple varieties. Uh, so that's, that's kind of right. what we were looking to do with that there, too. Uh, wow. Well, keep, keep us posted on how that goes. I mean, I Jared, one thing I wanted to mention about, you know, you talk about the, the beef jerky and everything and, and about the, my canning and all that. One thing we have not even mentioned is that the health benefits, how much healthier it is. We know exactly what we put in it, and it's just so much better for us to, that we've made it ourselves and, you know, are able, you know, know what is in our food. And, and it's something we haven't done yet, but we intend to, uh, uh, is that you can actually can meat. Right. Um, we haven't done it yet, but you can can, you can do it. You can can meat. Yeah, I've seen and that too. Uh, that's on, that's on my list of things to do as soon as we get some deer. Yeah. So that's what we've got. To, that's we got to do that. But oh, another thing I wanted to mention also, um, like to preserve your bell peppers and like jalapeno peppers, um, you can just not wash them, put them in a Ziploc bag, put them in the freezer. You know, get the air out, and you can just pull from there, thaw them out, and use them. Of course, you have to wash them. That's an easy way just to, to deal with them. And another thing with, with tomatoes, like with my salsa that I made, a lot of times you don't have 50 tomatoes that are all ripe all at the same time ready to make a big pot of salsa. And what I do, I do not wash them. I put them in a Ziploc bag. I put them in the freezer. And I have held them in the freezer till December when it's nice and cold and you don't mind standing over the stove. You take out your tomatoes. You put them in the sink. You wash them in very warm water, run warm water over them, and the skins just peel off almost on their own. They just, it's just, they split and it's just so easy to peel off. And then you can cut them and put them in your pot right from there. It really actually makes it easier to make salsa or canned tomatoes by freezing them first because the skins are so easy to come off. 
So that's just okay. a few little tricks that you can do. Now, I don't know Jared, if you I'll tell you. I was just going to tell you what I was saying a while ago with my, when the microphone was muted and you said, if you want me to hear you, I can't. And I said, I didn't want you to hear me. There's a fly buzzing around in here, and it keeps lighting on my laptop one millimeter from the camera, from the web camera. And what I said to Patty was, I wonder what it's going to look like when he moves directly in front of that camera. And uh, he hasn't yet, you know, but so if you, if it looks like we're being attacked by giant killer flies, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing, um, one of my favorite treats at our local farmer's market uh, is dehydrated okra. And the lady, I asked her, would she share with me her secret or was she going to make sure I would always be a loyal customer? And uh, she was willing to tell me what she did, but she also said it's a lot of trial and error and it doesn't always come out right. She didn't say it this way, but she kind of gave the impression that she has a, you know, a, a relative amount of loss uh, trying to do it. But she uh, was talking about using a very light coating of, I believe, like a canola oil and salting them and then dehydrating them. And she dehydrates them whole, but she dehydrates, um, you know, they're, they're probably only about three to four inches long. Um, and, man, that is just some kind of good. I mean, if you're, if you're a potato chip fanatic and, you know, you can't eat just one, guilty, um, that is something that you've just got to try. I don't know if it comes out with the same texture and flavor when you uh, dice it or slice it. Uh, like, uh, it doesn't. Or... No, it doesn't? Okay. Well, I tell no, you what. In fact, my, my sister has gotten them and my aunt has gotten them from the farmer's market in Baton Rouge. And they're whole and they're just wonderful. And that's what I was trying to do. But it didn't work. Um, those are whole. Those are whole, and but they're hard as a rock. <laughs> my mama, that's what my mama said. She said they taste good, but they're awful hard. So um, I will try. I've searched on the internet to try and find because I thought it's there's something more than just dehydrating them. So I'm gonna try light oil with a little salt and see. But they are just. I've had them. Jared, and you're right, they're just fantastic. I thought those were fantastic. But the little, the ones that I've cut taste very similar to that, what, what I've had at the, from the farmer's market. They're very good. So before we run out of time, one thing I really thought uh, was kind of a, a side shoot to this, but uh, important to mention, when, when we talk about preserving a lot of the times, I'd say 90% of the time, we're talking about preserving either raw or pre-made uh, <laughs> meals or food and uh, to me I think and maybe I'm stretching it here you tell me but I think uh, preserving seeds your own seeds uh, is is a method of preserving I mean I understand you're not uh, preserving yes. a food for you to eat over winter but mm -hmm. you're preserving the ability for you to create food next spring uh, and that is something that's that's new to us. Um, you know, I got to give a shout out uh, to our website that's right there uh, on my little banner here. We are uh, doing a giveaway this week for our first batch of organically grown heirloom lettuce seeds, and it's just a treasure to sit there and take the time to separate out the seed and and know that. Man, every single one of those hundreds of seeds can make another plant, and and realize yeah. that just the, the you know, for lack of a better word, the power that's involved with being able to sit there and say, look at all the food I could grow just from these yeah. little tiny yeah. seeds. Yes, it's really amazing. It's really amazing how it is, and you know that that just from one seed you can get so many seeds. I can't yeah. think of the guy's name. Uh, but he's kind of famous in the uh, gorilla gardening world. You know, he's a he's a gorilla gardener, and uh, he's got a great quote. He said, "Planting your own garden is like printing your own money." Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure if if we've lost connection. I don't see Jared. Um, there he is. Ta-da! I thought you were, I thought you were going to come back with your Superman cape on. I had a child. <laughs> 
I have so much enjoyed learning, and I still have a lot to learn, but we are trying to save our own seeds also. And I was just amazed that I saved some cucumber seeds, I think, year before last. And just the process of, of, of doing that and everything, it just really is a neat process. You know, and each each vegetable can be different. They're not all different. Some have the same methods, but like the lettuce, how it, you know, you let it go to go to flower and it goes to seed and you harvest the seeds. Cucumbers, the flower is going to make the cucumber. You let the cucumber get extra large, and when you cut it open, you have these wonderful seeds in there that you have to soak in water to get the pulp off. You know, it's a little process. It's totally different than collecting your lettuce seed. You know, there was this uh, lady that commented on, on my YouTube channel because I said, you know, look, I'm no expert. I'm just going to tell you how, how I'm collecting lettuce seeds. She came back and said, uh, and I, I apologize, I'd give the lady a shout out, but I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But she referenced an author who talks about seed saving and said that's exactly the same way she does it. And I went and looked up to find out more about this author, and I found a video of her. She was talking about uh, saving seeds. And uh, I love the example that she gave. She was talking about eating watermelon. And she said, here's what I want you to do. Go get a nice, ripe watermelon and get you a glass. And bite into that watermelon and spit the seed into the glass. And bite into the watermelon and spit the seed in the glass. And now when you're done, take that glass and rinse the seeds off and put them on a plate. And then just wait three days. And congratulations, you've saved seed. <laughs> it was just really funny, <laughs> you know, because they're like you say. There's, you know, everything's different, but some of them mm -hmm. are just so uh, easy that that you, you it's just mind-boggling yeah. that you know, there's nothing behind it. There's nothing to figure out. It's just a matter of make sure the seed dries so that it doesn't rot or sprout on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about that's it. Right. Now, now the most difficult and time-consuming is bacon seeds. It takes a little while for the bacon seeds to develop. Uh, well, you know, but we are waiting for those. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, they're coming eventually. Pigs are doing well, by the way. They're growing and uh, doing well. So, you know, one thing uh, we didn't talk year. One other thing we hadn't talked about with the last few minutes we've got here, uh, Pepper. Uh, we had talked to him about mentioning uh, his cheese making and how that kind of rolls into a way of uh, preserving food. And I think that that's yeah. uh, an important thing because sometimes um, you know, creating a food out of a out of another food product, like by making butter or cheeses or you know, creams and such uh, out of dairy products, that's another way for us to preserve the original food product into something different to still maintain a nutritious and beneficial food product further down the line and then if you want to get into the whole waxing it and preserving it that way then my goodness then you've, you've preserved it even further but mm -hmm. the, I don't I can't even it, it kind of opened up my mind to you know like I said you kind of sit there and you think preserving well that means pressure canning uh, but when yeah, you yeah. really open your mind up to the different ways that we make food last longer or make sure we have food in the future um, there's just a whole wide variety of things out there that really count as preserving our food. So, Yeah, and you're right about the cheese because I just saw on a show just recently, I can't remember what show it was, but they were showing and having taste tests of these different cheeses and some were, I want to say one cheese was like 50 years old, you actually can't buy any of that cheese anymore because there's so little of it left, but that, that it has been aged that long. So, you know, it, it truly is a way to preserve food by making cheese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, you know, uh, there are a lot of other ways uh, to preserve food. I mean, we talked about vacuum bagging, but there's also uh, impact uh, sealing, which is using like a mylar kind of bag. Uh, to, mm -hmm. to help, it's a real thick bag that, that keeps out light and rodents and things like that uh, for dry goods like beans. It doesn't do any vacuuming, it just seals a bag. Uh, you can do uh, dry canning using the same kind of aluminum cans that you uh, would buy food at the store. You can do that at home as well. Uh, but with both of these, you're getting into some pretty expensive equipment. Uh, and also, in our case, because uh, we've looked into it in the past, if you were to get into um, 
dry canning, you're probably going to run into some shipping issues unless you just happen to have a dealer in your area, a warehouse that stocks those things so you don't have to pay shipping. The cans are relatively cheap, but you can't stack these cans inside each other. Just like they're stacked on the store, so they got to put them in a box to ship them to you, and, and you get some astronomical shipping charges, um, and it really skyrockets the price for them. So it could be an option for you if you have access to the materials uh, really close nearby. So what do you guys think uh, over the last few minutes that we've got? Did we, did we miss anything? Is there something else that uh, maybe you don't do personally but that you've heard about or intrigues you? Well, there's one. There's um, a dry canning that I have read about. Um, there's different ones that use it. I, I, I read the a country. It's called Countryside Magazine, and they've had a lot of discussion in there about it. It's called oven canning, and it wouldn't be any any of the stuff that I've talked about. It's not that. It's more dry stuff, preserving like sugar for a longer period of time, flowers. Um, I think they even do crackers and stuff like that. So that's something that if anybody's interested, they can look up more information on the Internet, or that magazine's called Countryside. You can actually go and look at different uh, back issues and articles of it. But that's something I've thought about doing. But you know, my biggest jars that I use on a regular basis are uh, quart jars, and honestly, I would want to have a bigger jar than that to to can flour in or anything like that. So. And then the the only other thing that comes to my mind is long-term storage of large quantities of seed, like uh, corn kernels, uh, wheat kernels, things like mm -hmm. that. And we use five-gallon buckets. Patty, you might can talk about that because because yeah. the the whole deal is getting moisture, keeping moisture and critters out, yeah. and making sure there are no more there's no moisture and no little critters in there when you seal it. Right, and you I, you have to use ox oxygen absorbers. I've I've actually lost corn seed to weevils because that wasn't in a five-gallon bucket. It didn't have an oxygen absorber in it, and the weevils, the eggs are there, they're, and they're going to hatch under the right conditions. And unfortunately, I left the right conditions by not, you know, having oxygen absorbers and having. I didn't even have it in a five-gallon bucket. I just had a still a big old a 25-pound bag of corn. So I, I lost probably 50 pounds of corn doing it. Doing you that. can buy, you know, five-gallon buckets with lids for that purpose. You know, that seal yeah. real tightly. And I mean, Patty, you can you can keep whole kernel corn for, for for very many years. Very many years yeah. if you if you've done that right, you know. Yeah. And so, wheat also can be done that way. Yeah. So, so I think I, I kind of. And the only thing I know, I know we're about to I know we're about to uh, to wind down. So I, I just want to say quickly, Patty rattled through a lot of that stuff in in her presentation. Uh, there are people out there saying, "I didn't get that. I didn't get that." Have no fear. Contact us. If you have questions about anything that she mentioned, um, at info at aldermanfarms.net, and uh, we'll hook you up with Patty, and she'll be happy to, uh, to, to answer your questions as best she can. All right, so there was uh, one thing, Tommy, you said it yourself, and then uh, one of our viewers here, um, I imagine it's either uh, Joey or Holly uh, up here at the uh, Wisconsin Veg uh, Veggie Gardeners, uh, they shared here this comment that there is more power in seeds uh, than there is in meat, <laughs> and uh, and I can see yes. a lot of truth behind that because you know the the seed is it's the power to be able to feed yourself, it's the power to be able to get more out of it. You know, a dollar's worth a dollar, but one seed's worth an entire plant, which then turns into a hundred more seeds, which then turns into a thousand plants. So I mean, there's well, a lot. Yeah, he's exactly out. right. And when you think about that one dollar. At one dollar, might buy one. You know, and I don't know how much it costs because we don't, we rarely buy seeds. But the, you know, that dollar may buy so many seeds today, and it's going to buy fewer seeds next year, more likely. Mm -hmm. Well, right. if I've got my own seeds, I ain't got to worry about how many seeds that dollar will get because I don't need them. All right. Well, I want to uh, thank everybody who's taken the time to uh, be with us, and also thank Patty and Tommy. Uh, Patty's a real trooper. I, I know uh, she sounds like she's doing a little worse with the throat issue today than, than Tommy is. So, yeah. Patty, thank you for uh, being willing to do that. We certainly would have had a lot thinner of a show without without you uh, being willing to, to go through that presentation. So, so thank you very much well, for thank that. Thank you.
Thank uh, you. I enjoyed it. So again, thank you all for, for watching. Uh, Tommy and Patty, do you have anything to close out with? Just have be have safe canning. Safe canning. Safe canning. Follow the read the instruct men. Read the instructions. <laughs> you have first. To read the instructions first. First. <laughs> no, the only thing I just remind everybody uh -oh. that, that Jared is gonna oh Patty has something else to add, but let me say this quickly. Uh, uh, you'll be able to watch this again either on Jared's YouTube channel, and Jared is always gracious enough to uh, to share the file with me, and so it'll also be on our YouTube channel at Alderman Farms, so you can rewatch it uh, if there's something that you missed. Okay. Um, I also wanted to uh, tell the viewers too, if you're interested, there is a Facebook page that's that's devoted to canning, and different ones write in, they show what they've been canning, and you get a lot of different ideas and stuff like that. So it's very interesting. So, so if the, you're on Facebook, look up the canning. Is page. it a, a page or group? Group. It's, it's a, a group. It's a group. And it's just canning. I don't know. It's like a bunch of people in it, though, right? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. A whole so bunch just of search Facebook uh, for a group to do with canning and pick the one that has a bazillion people in it, and that's probably it. Well, I'm going to put some words in your mouth, and I'm going to give you a better idea, and I'm going to tell everybody to go to Alderman Farms on Facebook, and sometime in the next 24 hours, Tommy will go on there and inform you of the correct group. There you go. Terms. Yeah, that's there right. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> I knew you were, but you hadn't read the instructions. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I All right, so once again, uh, guys, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time to, to watch us, whether you are joining us live or if you're watching this in the future. Um, please just take the time and... Uh, Realize the power of your food and you know preserve what you can, whether that's by preserving the seeds, preserving the final food, creating another food product that you can preserve, or whatever the means are, and, and lengthen out that food as long as it can for the use and benefit of yourself and your family. So thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next month. Bye. 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 Adios. Ciao.